Well, Shavier Whitford, welcome to the journey. And uh, I know that you're, you're not a stranger to the journey. You've been, this is your third time uh, being on, on the show. And I think you're the first uh, individual that I've had on three times besides uh, Dalton and Kylie. So, uh, so thank you for uh, being willing to come on and um, willing to, to speak on, I know uh, a tough subject, but uh, also uh, some of the movement, some of the things that you've been able to do with uh, the people that you're impacting and and then the impact you're having on the community. So, uh, so welcome once again. Thanks for having me. So, uh, so uh, just to, just a real real quick, and and I know a lot of the people who've been listening, they know, they know you, and but um, in the past year or so, has there been any new activities that you found any either way of kind of pleasure or a way of kind of grounding yourself or kind of being able to kind of uh, you know. Uh, way of you having fun now anything new going on in your life that you've been doing um yeah I think this year we've done a lot more you know just being outdoors and kayaking has always been something uh, we took up like a couple years ago and you know getting more and more involved in that I also um you know it's funny this whole COVID season new things have come up where um, we ended up buying a camper that we re like an old camper we refurbished and we put it up on a piece of farmland up north that my brother lives on and so that's been our little retreat is going up there and getting away into the country and just hanging out and camping um, at my brother's farm and um, i also actually this year <laughs> started riding a motorcycle so um, I used to ride motorcycles a long, long, many, many years ago and um, bought a motorcycle and started riding again this year. And so that's been kind of new and exciting and um, fun. Uh, a couple friends that I've met, uh, you know, through different things that I do also have motorcycles and are women. And so it's been fun to kind of like get our little biker chip group together and go out and learn to ride and encourage one another. <laughs> so. It's definitely, you know, it's a season of my life where, you know, my daughter's off to college and she's, you know, grown and, and doing amazing things in her own life. And I don't have to, you know, worry so much or stress about it. And um, my granddaughter and her mom are doing well um, in a lot of aspects. So we have a lot of more free time on our hands where we're trying to experiment and do some of the things we've always wanted to do um, kind of like as empty nesters that we really haven't had the chance to do. So it's been it's been a pretty exciting, fun year, actually, you know, even considering everything going on, so. Sure, sure. So, uh, so McKay graduated from college this year, um, from undergraduate. Now, did she go back to school for her master's? Yep, she is going back for her master's. She's got two and a half years for occupational therapy. Um, she's just doing amazing. She's got two jobs. She's working at a um, dance studio as a dance instructor um, up by her school. And then she also just accepted a behavioral therapist position at um, Autism Intervention Milwaukee, working with one to four year olds that are um, at risk for autism. And that's just right up her alley, working with kids and working with, you know, the behavioral aspect of kids. So she's just, you know, living with some roommates in a house up there and doing amazing. And I'm just so, so proud of how far she's come and how hard she works. And it's just really, you know, it's my greatest blessing is just watching her achieve all her goals and accomplishments in life. I'm sure you understand. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like watching your kids just do those things. It's like, wow, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I'll have to double check with Sierra because I think that is actually the place that Sierra is doing her internship. Because oh, really? She, she's in her senior year at Milwaukee, and um, and she had a she's getting her BSW, uh, Bachelor's of Social Work, and I think she has a four year old high functioning autism girl that she's working with. But I think that's the place that she's working with. Wow, that's awesome! So, so Small world. I'll have to double check and, and find out. So, because I know that uh, she just, unfortunately, uh, McKay had to do a virtual graduation this year from the University mm -hmm. of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, but but she did still get the diploma and she and was able yep. to secure that. So uh, even though I know a lot of people are struggle, you know, struggled with not being able to the normal uh, ceremonies and and rituals and those rites of rites of passages and those those things that we normally look forward to obviously have been uh, had a had a change because of the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, for sure. So, but I'm glad that that part you know that 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 piece got checked for her. So now she's yeah. the next stage and um, and she'll do great. She's uh, 
you know, she's got a great heart and has a strong work ethic, just like her mom and dad. Um, so now to going back to the bikes, uh, does Corey have a bike too? Yeah, he's had a motorcycle for okay. many, many years. And obviously I rode with him. It's just a new experience, me riding my own motorcycle and being yep. able to go, you know, solo. So Absolutely. it's something that we enjoy, but we don't get to do as often as we would like. But it seems like this last year, we've been able to get out more and enjoy it and do everything. Sure. So, so I know one of the things that, and obviously one of the reasons why I wanted to have you come back on during this time period is because it's Suicide Awareness Month. And, and one of... Uh, uh, one of the things that I know you've been doing now for, I think, five years has it been um, for the... Actually, we had our seventh annual, <laughs> believe oh it my, or not, oh my seventh gosh. annual bike run in okay. August. Yeah, okay. because the year Tommy died in 2014, that year they held one. And then we've held one ever since then. And we okay. just had his six year anniversary of his death. So it's actually this year was the seventh annual okay. um, ride to fight suicide is what okay. we call it. Okay, so they, so they ended up doing that walk like immediately only a couple weeks after Tommy died. The ride, yeah, yeah. The ri not the walk, but the ride the was ride. done. Um, he died in August and they did it in October that oh, October. first year. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so now they've been doing it in August. Typically yep. the, the ride's been in August. Now, did you guys ride this year or did you, I know in the past you've, you've driven in a car, but did you ride this year yourself? I mean, yeah, well, no, we have always rode. Um, oh, we, okay. my daughter and usually some, a lot of people come with cars, but I always usually ride with my husband and then we okay. have friends that sometimes McKay rides with, but yeah, we did ride. Okay. Um, we lead the ride every year and this year it was just phenomenal. I mean, we had, even with COVID and everything going out, the out turn was just like, we were overwhelmed. So many, we had probably twice as many bikes than we've ever had, um, less cars, but way more bikes. And then we had a bunch of people that just showed up out at Kegels where the ride ended just to support us and eat and hang out and do the, you know, raffles and things like that. So, um, but we counted, we had like over 80 some bikes oh that God. showed up and, you know, a um, hundred and some people all together, but it was, um, everybody was, you know, just there. And, you know, like we said, it's even with COVID, like we were very respectful of all the regulations and the rules and everything that we needed to, but you know, what we're fighting for is bigger than COVID, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like this is people's lives too. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and we, we knew we had to do this. We had to cancel. We actually canceled our walk that we do every year, um, rescheduled it and then had to cancel it again because that walk we typically have like three to 400 people. And we just didn't feel that that was, a safe thing to do with everything going on and the situation, but the ride we knew that we needed to do and that we could do and do it in a safe way. And it was, it was awesome. awesome. Nice. Well, good for, good for you guys. So uh, I, I know, you know, we've had numerous over the years, we've talked, you know, a, a lot and talked about the grieving process and, and knowing that being able to share uh, Tommy's story is, uh, even though I know you shared it, you know, tons of times, more times than you probably can even count. Um, but it is always a way of honoring um, uh, Tommy, as, as well as giving the the foundational story of what you do now and what your purpose is now. So, so for the for the listeners and for people that may not know Tommy's story, um, do do you mind sharing a little bit about Tommy's story? Oh, absolutely. Um, so Tommy was my firstborn. He was who first made me mom, and. Um, Obviously, there's just so much love that comes with that and that first experience having him. Um, and Tommy was always, you know, from the very beginning, he was always just a, a happy-go-lucky, smiling, bright-eyed, beautiful child, you know, um, the best baby ever, unlike my daughter, who was like colicky and cried all the time. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, he was just, he was always just a sweetheart. And, but, you know, unfortunately, Tommy had to experience a trauma early on in his life at the age of three when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, we lost Tommy's dad in a drinking and driving accident. And um, that forever, you know, impacted Tommy. That trauma stayed with him his entire life. 
Um, he fought a lot throughout the years. He was in and out of counseling from the time he was three years old. He, um, you know, had a lot of anger issues of, you know, why his dad wasn't here, why he didn't know his dad, why his dad was drinking and, you know, ultimately was the, the person responsible for it. Um, there was just a lot that went with his story and throughout the years he struggled off and on and we were always there, you know, always in and out of counseling, talking to doctors, doing what we needed to just support him. But it was um, in middle school, he got diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Um, and then when he got into high school, we started to know some, notice some even more drastic changes where he was having um, outbursts of anger, a lot more isolation. Um, he started to withdraw from a lot of the normal activities that he did. Like he was um, a phenomenal soccer player. He played club soccer for eight years of his life. And after his freshman year, he just quit. He just was like, I'm done. Um, and, you know, his, his high school years were a struggle, just getting, you know, keeping him focused, keeping him in school. But, you know, he always was just that likable, lovable, funny kid that everybody just you know, look to, to laugh, to smile, to hang out with. Even the teachers, they would get so mad at him and they would be like, he's so infuriating, but I just love that kid, you know, because that was just Tommy. He was that person that everybody just loved. Um, but he ended up graduating high school late and um, around the same time he graduated, he found out his on again, off again girlfriend was pregnant. And um, ultimately um, he, began struggling more mentally with that, I think, um, around the fact of becoming a father, what kind of father would he be, that he never was raised by his father and his father wasn't there. And, um, you know, there was an incident that happened where him and his girlfriend got in a fight and um, I went to go check on him. He was living with a family friend because he had moved out after he graduated high school. And, um, and I found that he had taken his life by suicide. And, um, you know, I, the first thing that comes to mind is why, you know, why obviously you ask yourself that and I just, I still, I still don't understand why it had to be him, but um, I've come to understand what he was feeling and going through in that moment and I've come to understand a lot that I didn't understand, didn't know, didn't, um, wasn't educated in a lot of ways. Um, it doesn't make sense how a beautiful, smiling, loved, you know, um, supported boy with so much potential could feel that there was no reason to live. But, you know, understanding and learning what I have now and knowing that, you know, that mental illness and that depression takes control of your thoughts and you can't always think of, you know, the good and, you know, you get stuck in the bad and you get stuck in that thinking of feeling that you're worthless and and unworthy. And um, so I've come to understand a lot of where he was at and why he did what he did just through listening to other people who have experienced it themselves and learned a lot through those people. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I've had to learn my own journeys too, because I found my son that day. And obviously the, the trauma associated with seeing your child um, in that way has affected me and will affect me for the rest of my life. Um, but thankfully I would, I've been able to, you know, get the correct amount of support and therapy and things to get me to, um, be able to talk about it and not have to relive it like it was that day, um, and be able to learn from it. But it's something that I, you know, I, I still struggle with personally too. So that as well has given me an in-depth, um, understanding of, not having control, right? Like not having control of what's going on. When I would have my um, situations of PTSD, like I couldn't control what was happening in my mind or my body in those moments. And it showed me how, how it, it's real, right? It's real that people lose control and um, they need people around them to help them keep them safe and guide them and, you know, and, and you need to address those things. And so through that learning process, um, it's made me more empathetic, compassionate, understanding, um, and a great listener because, you know, um, I always say I, I don't, I'm not a counselor. I don't have the, you know, letters behind my name, right? But I'm educated by the people that live it every day. 
um, I understand through listening to the stories of the people that live it every day. And that has just given me this purpose and passion in my life to just keep helping and spreading education and spreading awareness and um, creating a, a, an atmosphere of learning and, and listening and, and supporting people that need it. Well, I think, you know, I think there's something too that, that is kind of key. Not only did you, you know, uh, you know, I know very quickly, you know, that you, well, through, through Corey, um, cause I grew up with Corey, you know, with, with Ty, um, that you and I had had some conversations early on and you were, you were early on trying to, um, you were moving toward the pain versus avoiding the pain, right? And and either through education or just trying to, you know, seek and search, you know, regarding maybe not answers for why, or maybe that was part of it too, but it was also just trying to know those gaps that you didn't know about, right? And and being willing to talk about it, and which I think was key from that very first talk that you did with me um, uh, after Tommy died at, at Boylan for the Natural Helpers um, to to how it's evolved. And but I think the, the one of the other keys as I've as I've watched you over these years is that you've done your own work, and by I think doing your own work with the PTSD and then consequently all the depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms that, that go along with that, as well as just the natural grieving process, um, it's allowed you to have you, to be able to reflect on your own experience, um, not just vicariously through other people, right? And right. Um, so, so when you said something earlier, I want to, I want to see if you can maybe articulate for, for us, um, you said about not being able uh, like when when a, an episode of of the PTSD would happen, um, wouldn't be able to control it, and and I don't know for sure if everyone really can grasp what you what you mean by not being able to control it. So like what like control what what, what well so I've always been one of those people. I'm very like I. I've learned I'm very resilient, right? I've, I've had a life that is a lot of bad, right? I mean, a lot of bad circumstances from my childhood, um, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse, different things that have happened to me throughout my life. And I'm, I'm very resilient. So in a lot of ways, like when usually things happen to me, I'm able to mentally, like almost like shift myself and adjust myself to um, to deal and accommodate with that almost, I don't want to say more naturally than others. I don't know why I'm more resilient than someone else, but I know I've been through a lot of crap in my life mm -hmm. and that has caused me to become, you know, a little bit more resilient, but also my faith is a huge part, I think, of it as well. And my faith and understanding that and belief that, you know, God will work everything to his glory. And, and so trusting that even in the worst circumstances and the worst situations. But when I was going through my PTSD, I didn't, so after losing Tommy, I started grief counseling like right away. I mean, I was like in a week I was in counseling. Um, within a week, I was part of a grief support group. Um, I, you know, I knew I had to do the work. I knew I had to get help. I knew I couldn't do it by myself, but I didn't realize that I was doing all of that, but I wasn't addressing the trauma of finding my son. And so it wasn't until about a year after Tommy that it, it started to hit me and started to really affect me to where I was having major panic attacks. Um, you know, like I remember one time driving down the street on my lunch and a ambulance was in front of me and they must have got a call and they turned on their sirens and the sirens just threw my whole body and mind into like I was reliving that moment of finding my son that day all over again and I was shaking and I was panicking and I couldn't breathe and like I had and no matter how hard I was trying to calm myself and change and shift my mind like I've done so many times and it's you know been able to do it and it's work I couldn't I couldn't stop it. I just had to let it, you know, almost like let it happen. And then, you know, and then of course, you know, oh, it's just one time I'll be fine. And then like, again, you know, I'm at work and I, I honestly can't even remember 
what was said or what happened, but all I remember was starting to ha have that feeling again where like my chest started beating and I started going into a panic attack and I started to just start crying uncontrollably and I found myself in the bathroom, in the corner, balled up, crying, weeping, shaking uncontrollably. And it was in that moment that I said, like, I can't do this, like, that I need help. Like, and through this time, you know, people had said, oh, you know, you should try this therapy or you should try this or you should do this. And I was like, you know, no, I'm doing enough. Like, I'm doing enough. Like, I go into support groups, I'm going to grief counseling, like, I'm good. I'm, you know, I even got prescribed some anxiety medication that I was taking for a while. But I realized that, you know, it wasn't enough in that moment, because obviously if it was enough, I wouldn't be in the situation that I was in. And what it came down to was realizing that I was addressing some of the issue, but I wasn't addressing the trauma issue that I found my son and that that trauma like affects you and it affects you until you're able to process it, until you're able to work through it and reprogram it. And um, so I, Personally, what helped me, and it's different for everybody, but personally what helped me is I was connected with an EMDR therapist, which I was totally 100%. Like, this is crazy. Like, this is not going to work. What the heck is this? How is this going to work? Like, I was completely against it, but I was at a point that I was like, I will try anything. Like, if you told me to stand upside down on my head for 10 minutes a day and it would help me, I would have tried it. Like, I was that desperate to not feel how I was feeling. So um, I went to an, one of the EMDR specialists that is very well known in the, at that point in time in the city, she's since retired. And I can say that honestly, that therapy saved my life. Like it changed my life. It, it helped me in more ways than I could ever explain. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for it because I'm able to talk about it and I'm not, I don't have to relive it like it's doing that. My, those feelings of, um, you know, I still deal with some stuff from time to time, but nothing like I was feeling in those moments of, you know, that I've expressed and explained, you know, in those moments, those were like a couple, there were many more than that, but nothing like that anymore. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, and I'm glad you brought, I mean, I'm I'm sorry to hear you know that not only the the stuff that you endured earlier in your life, um, but I think you make a great point. And you know we we talk about resilient. We're not born with resiliency. Resiliency is developed over our lifetime, and and it's and it's it happens as a re, it happens when we have setbacks, right? We when we fall down, resilience is about standing up. You know, and I know that sometimes it's not real, you know, it's, it's, it's popular among some parents to try to bubble wrap our children so that they never fall down or that, you know, they don't have any adversity, right. but that's how, unfortunately, how we develop resiliency. Now, that doesn't mean that there should be abuse though, right? So, um, right. but to survive the abuse, some individuals are more prone to being able to disassociate, um, another way of saying compartmentalize um, that experience so that they can put it into a box as they endure whatever the, whatever the trauma slash abuse is going on. Um, and intellectually, mentally, it goes into that box. Unfortunately, then it also goes into parts of our body and it's suppressed slash repressed into our body. And then it comes out other times and it could be because of another trauma or it could be something completely different or it could be you know uh, some other type of trigger when you know when McKay is at the same age as 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 you were when the abuse happened or, or whatever it may be um, and I think that I think that's a great example of how um, we can't always talk talk therapy our way um, it, it sometimes isn't enough when there's been um, this emotional response to the trauma, right? Um, there's a physical and emotional response to the trauma and, and we need to be able to process through that. Um, and EMDR is one of those techniques that mm -hmm. allows that to happen. Um, but yes, it's true. We have, to, we have to mentally somehow surrender and get out of the way enough um, for, for that to work. Um, 
but it also works because it isn't asking us to intellectualize it. It's 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 right. working at a different level um, of of healing and putting it into a perspective of um, uh, of what it isn't versus what we're our body's still reliving when it gets triggered, right? right. Um, but I think that's a great example. And and I also think, you know, for, for individuals that are listening that are either going through grieving or have had their own trauma, that it is a process. It's this process of the stuff, the stuff you did immediately upon uh, Tommy's death was exactly what you needed to do then. And for that year or so afterwards, that's exactly what you needed to be able to do. But then it was time that you needed to go and do a different type of work and, and more work. And, and, there, and there very much may have been a cumulative effect of the previous trauma that you were talking about, um, that it was too big to put in the boxes that earlier was utilized. Right. Well, and it's a lifelong process. I mean, I know I shared this with you already, but I just this weekend had a situation completely unrelated to any of this but the feelings of loss of control and possible loss threw me into a, you know, I don't even know how to explain it, but I was not okay. Like mentally and physically, I was not feeling okay. Was, um, and that was, you know, we were kayaking, which is something I find very, very relaxing and very helpful to be in nature and the water. It's always been a peaceful place for me. And we had a freak situation accident with high, you know, water and currents that threw me into a tree, which caused me to flip my kayak. And then my friend ended up flipping hers and we didn't see her at first and thought maybe she was under the kayak, under the water. And that whole situation, it, it ended up being nothing, right? I mean, it was like a whole like two minutes of an ordeal that was quite scary, but everybody was okay. Everything was okay. The worst thing that happened is my phone ended up in the, end of the bottom of the river, but um, <laughs> phones are replaceable. But that whole experience, like that night and the next day, like I couldn't, you know, like I couldn't put into words like why I was feeling the way I was feeling, but it, it like affected me. It affected me mentally and physically going through that experience. And the only, you know, as I've been journaling and, and meditating and praying like over it, like the only thing that kind of makes sense is that, you know, there was a moment of fear because I couldn't see my friend and I thought my friend could be dead or dying, you know, and she was fine. She was behind the kayak and she's short, so we couldn't see her. But like in my mind, my mind went there, right? Because that's one thing that I struggle with a lot is when you experience the worst kind of experience, like your worst nightmare comes true and you find your child dead. Like your mind goes to the worst things all the time, like always. You know, I hear an ambulance and I automatically think, where's my family? Yep. You know, like that's just the new norm for me. And I know, and I've learned how to like, again, you know, adjust my thinking, calm myself, like don't go there. You don't have to think that way, but it doesn't stop it from happening. <laughs> right, right. And that's what happens. Is yeah. My mind went there. It totally freaked me out. And I, and it took me a day and a half to get myself to where I was okay again, because it, it, that sense of loss, that sense of loss of control, um, feeling like you, you're helpless, like that's all that I felt when I lost my son. And I felt that in that experience too. So it's almost like it took me back to that. And I got all those feelings back again and trying to process them and deal with them. And so, you know, six years later, incident completely unrelated, yep. still affects me. Yep. It's life, you know, it's, it's part of the whole journey. Yep. Well, and I, and I think, you know, when we, you know, what you just described was, you know, you're kayaking, something that's normal and that, you know, relaxing, serenity, you know, spiritual experience. And, and, and then, because of the current, because of something going sideways, no pun intended, that um, that it became now a threatening situation and your body's going to respond to any type of threat, whoever you are, to go into that fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. So adrenaline's pumping, all this, and then you see now what's happening to your friend. You're in that fight or flight. All these chemicals are going. And even 120 seconds later, when everyone's okay, 
there's still that element that your body is in that um, uh, that fight or flight, right? And it's still and it's still processing. And then the story that we tell ourselves, right? Like in your case, you you have gotten that news um, that your husband died in a car accident. You have been there finding Tommy. So there, so then we can kick in a story, which then keeps the right. adrenaline going, right? right. Um, and we also know that there's a part, our body's also equipped not only to uh, get away from or fight something that's threatening, our, also, our body also has the parasympathetic nervous system has the ability to rest and digest. But because of previous trauma, you may have to go through uh, some extra steps to still get to that space where you're grounded. And why don't you share a little bit about, you know, because you know, tell us a little bit about what you did, you know, on, on Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, what, what are some things you did to kind of get you back? Well, Sunday night, when we got home, I had a major meltdown. <laughs> I literally like just screamed and bawled and shaked and cried and just like I had to let it out because mm -hmm. I had been holding it because after the incident, obviously we held it together because we wanted to get finished getting down the river to where our car was, right? Yeah. So, um, but then, you know, I couldn't sleep at all Sunday night, woke up Monday, got ready for work, went to, you know, went to work and I just was emotional, like constantly crying for no reason. And my body felt just like, like I felt like my heart was beating a million miles an hour and I was just on high alert, you know, like very high anxiety. Um, I ended up coming home from work because I realized that I just, I had to self care, right? Like I, there's no way I was properly functioning and I wasn't going to do anybody good constantly crying. So I came home and I just did a lot of self care. Um, I, you know, took a nice long hot bath. I used essential oils. I, you know, tried to meditate and pray and just, um, try to stay as calm and as peaceful as I could to get my body just to kind of come down and then. Um, Tuesday, I had actually had an appointment with a therapist that I go to monthly um, for massage therapy work and different things that she does. And she uses, you know, CBD oils and essential oils and all sorts of different kinds of things to kind of help with whatever I'm dealing with. And so I told her, I'm like, I'm, I'm dealing with some stuff like some body and mental stress right now through a situation that happened over the weekend. And she really focused on all that and helped to calm my body and when I walked out of that appointment I felt um like 90 percent better you know I mean I still wasn't 100 percent but I was like way better so you know I think it's just important to for me and I tell people this all the time and I'm learning to do it myself is listen to your body yeah. right when you need to stop and rest and take care of yourself like do it. And I am one of those people that go, 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 go nonstop. And it's hard for me to say no. And it's hard for me to, to do that. But I know that I have to do that because I'm not going to be any good to anybody else if I don't take care of myself first. Right. So, well, and, and, and that's a big part, you know, that I wanted you to, I, I'm, I'm, gr I'm grateful that you shared that because because I think sometimes people think that it shouldn't be that way, right? That you shouldn't be affected by something. It shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. If I was farther along, then I wouldn't have this kind of response. If I had done more work or done whatever, and that's not, none of that's true. You know, it's, it's, it's literally, um, we have to take it on when it's happening. And the sooner that we can, maybe the easier it is to overcome it, you know, um, and so I think it is true. You, like you said, you have to find that tension between, um, you know, sometimes we do need to push ourselves, you know, to, you know, to discipline ourselves or to whatever it may be. And then sometimes we also need to, to pull back and say, no, I need, I need to take it easy today. I need to, you know, this, this is my body telling me I need to, to rest or, or something like that. In other days, this is me telling, I have to, I have to push my body to move. It's my head that's saying I have to rest and it's, I'm just not feeling it, right? You know, type of thing. Yeah. So, but I think it's so important because, you know, <clears throat> it, it may be true, uh, like you said, that we, you can't control 
what is happening and why it may be happening, but we can control what, how we respond to it, right? That, you know, you didn't know for sure, you tried different things at home um, and it just happened to work out that you had that massage already scheduled. Um, and, and you knew that you had to take that time off of work. You knew that, um, and you knew you had to show up for that appointment, right? So I think those are all things, as much as we can't control, there are those things that we can control. Right. You know, okay. and, and I think that is, I know that that's been a big proponent of, of, of your message. And as much as you uh, were an integral part of helping me with Shatter Our Silence and about the idea that um, the silence and the shame that comes with keeping the secrets and keeping things inside um, are, are a huge part of trying to break that stigma around that. And, and just with what you talked about, that sometimes there's more too. We have to not only talk about it, but we also have to um, reach out to those key individuals that can, that know us and they can help us, um, right. can move into a different space. Right, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I want to touch on, you know, you, you're involved with a, a lot of different things. And sometimes um, there might be some people in your life would say too many things. Um, but I know it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to say no. And that, and I, I resemble that as well. And, and what's the key things to say no to so I can say yes to the, to the, to the right things. But, um, you know, you, you have really taken the, the, um, uh, mental health first aid um, with Chief Evans. You guys have done a phenomenal job with that. I know that you are now getting, um, uh, I think from a statewide, you guys are going to be able to, I know some of there's some still barriers because of, uh, because of COVID, but right. being able to bring that into the school system and, and you've been doing that and you've been doing support groups, let, let alone some of the, uh, some of the city um, initiatives and, and community initiatives. But let's let's talk a little bit about how, from your perspective, how has the quarantine, how has um, the social distancing, the impact of 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 COVID, the impact of of what's going on with all the political and the civil and, and the racial unrest, what what's been your observation of what's been going on in the last six months? Well, um, you know, I think obviously the state of our nation right now with everything going on is um, causing a lot of, of emotional and mental stress in a lot of people, right? Um, and then you add in the social distancing and um, changes due and restrictions due to COVID and it makes it a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult to actually support and be there for individuals that need that support. Um, we, you know, we did the Zoom support groups and I primarily, my support groups, I work with teens and young adults. And I can tell you that um, neither teens or young adults want virtual anything. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not the same. It doesn't feel the same. It, um, they, you know, they're, they were willing to try it. They tried it. Um, a lot of them didn't like it. They felt uncomfortable. They didn't feel like it was the same connection. So we did that for quite a few months and had very low, um, you know, numbers from people that were attending. But um, now we are meeting again in person. Uh, we started meeting in person of the last, I think, in August. And the numbers are continuing to rise again. Um, you know, obviously, we have to. You know, it's still not the same because you're wearing masks. You're, you know, not really seeing the person. You're not seeing, you know, their face and their feelings and you know what's going on. It's very hard to to read face. You know, like I'm a face reader. I love to look at people's faces and really feel what they're feeling and see what they're trying to convey. And it's hard for me, but being in person is a lot easier because you can hear, right? You know, you can hear the, the, I think a little bit better than virtually, but so we're still working on moving our way back into and building up the numbers again for the support groups in person. But um, we've, it's, it's been an adjustment, we'll just say, and it hasn't worked as, as well as we had hoped. And um, everybody's, you know, like, People that were struggling before with mental health issues, it's it's not better because of COVID. It's worse because of COVID and social distancing. So 
you know, and sometimes sadly, like with the groups that I do, some of the students, um, the teens and stuff that come to my group, literally the only interaction they get with people is at the group. So then when you take that away, it's really like distancing them completely from society and people that they can relate to. And it's, it's heartbreaking to see that and to see that effect. Um, but, you know, the good thing about what's been going on just with the whole, um, you know, everything is I think people are more communicating and issues are being brought to the table that need to be brought out and discussed. Um, I was part of a roundtable discussion locally with um, the police and local leaders and aldermen last night talking about mental health um, and training for mental health for the police and uh, public safety within our community. And, you know, like, hey, that hasn't happened before. I'm glad that it's happening now. Like, you know, we're having a community-wide discussion about mental health and the need for additional training and support within our community. Um, and although there might be conversations that have happened on the side or here or there, like this was a large gathering of people talking on this topic, which was very encouraging to me. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, one of the things working with NAMI, because I sit on the NAMI board, um, that I'm very passionate about is the legislation and advocacy. And we have been having a lot of meetings and discussions with state and local leaders on um, just the, situ the, the situation our community is in, that our state is in when it comes to mental health and mental health care, and starting to have good conversations about what we can do to change that and to make the best impact um, with the new mental health uh, tax that was approved at the last um, voting that was voted in, um, you know, there's going to be funding available now, right? So, you know, usually with these conversations, it's always, well, we don't have money to provide mental health training to the officers or CIT training to the officers. Well, now we have a funding mechanism to support that to get people properly trained and start to um, put money behind some of these different methods and models that are available. And so, um, you know, it's it's funny because I always said I'm not a political person, but I found myself working in politics as a full-time job, and then I find myself being involved in politics um, on a part-time basis with what I'm doing with mental health and suicide in the community. So I might not be that person, but for some reason, God's chose me to be in that avenue, and I'm trying to use those connections and those relationships to improve the, you know, care and um, quality of care in our, our state and community through those connections and through that opportunity. And so um, there's things happening. And obviously, like I said, you know, even with all those conversations, COVID is still putting a hold on a whole lot of things. But my hope and my belief is that once, once this passes, which it will, right? Um, once it passes, we're going to see a whole big push of things come through and change that are going to be um, a positive impact for the mental health community and our, our community as a whole. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, it had been very interesting, you know, and a lot of the talks that I normally would be doing and you'd be doing right now there, obviously it's, it's shifted. Um, and, and because they're not, we're not doing them in person and, and that aspect of it, but probably in the last week, um, when school's gotten rolling a little bit, maybe the last two weeks, I've started getting more calls um, from health teachers or from counselors and, and what things can, you know, can we do? Can we come in and do a talk? Can we do different things? Because there's this interest in one, it's on the table. Let's put it that way. It's on, it's on the table. There's concerns. And I think there's this element of just the heaviness there's like a heaviness, right? Because there's not only the anxiety and the uncertainty of everything, but there's just this unheavy, there's this heaviness of, I just don't know. And there's been so much of finger pointing on certain, certain areas and certain topics and us versus them and, you know, that type of stuff, which just leads so much more to that heaviness and that sadness, let alone the violence and, uh, you, know, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, that element of that's, that's impacting people. So 
it, it, so I think it's, you know, uh, this education that you've been able to do and NAMI's been able to do um, that, yes, we do have, let's say, if it's 25% of our population that are officially diagnosed um, with a mental illness, but that isn't to say that the other 75% of our population aren't being impacted because it isn't like, you know, it isn't a fine line in the sand um, where, you know, on this side of the line, you're 100% okay. In this side, well, you know, they're probably not really helping themselves or, or whatever, whatever may be going on. And, and I think there is this, um, I, I think there's definitely a movement of understanding that we're on, we all are on this continuum, kind of like what you were talking about with your story over the last 72 hours is that, yeah, even though I'm doing a lot of good things in your healing and recovery, we can have an event that lasts two minutes, but I need to continually work at um, uh, being whole. And, and, it's, and it's not a stagnant state. Having, having panic or depression isn't a stagnant state, but being well isn't a stagnant state either. It's fluid. Okay. And, yep. um, and really being able to kind of raise that awareness, shatter some of the, the stigmas and the silence about that. Um, and, and similar to some of the racial issues that are, that are going on, um, being honest with what we don't know and what we think we know about mm -hmm. someone that may be going through something different than ourselves. Um, you know, we, we fall in this category, humans do, as, of being egocentric thinking that how I view my experience is how everyone viewed their experience, right? Right. Uh, we, we know that isn't true. And I was just out walking, uh, waiting for us to have our conversation I, in my neighborhood. And it was, I, it was one, I was blown away. It was a beautiful night and there was tons of people, kids, you know, there must've been 15, yeah, maybe 10, 10 kids riding their bikes up and down the street. And, and the dogs were, you know, people walking dogs and my, my neighbor, we were just having some conversation about, you know, different things. I was asking him questions. He was telling me certain things. And, and we just both talked about there's, we, we don't know if we don't ask. And, mm -hmm. and I've just learned that it's better, better for me to be honest with what I don't know and, and ask. And when um, I'm struggling with some, something, confusion, hurt, whatever it is, I need to find someone to talk to about that and, and, and move toward that pain versus avoiding it. So. Yeah, um, that's an, a, a good point. And I think that that's what I see a lot and it is, and I agree that it's almost like when somebody disagrees with you or somebody thinks that they know something more than you or um, that you don't know enough, right? What I see is people just shut down. They, you know, shut down and push away. And I feel like we need to bring those people in and listen and learn and talk and, and hear both perspectives, right? You know, um, it, it's just, I guess that, I feel like that could solve a whole lot of problems is that people would just be willing to listen and learn and hear. Doesn't mean you're gonna agree or, you know, come to agree with the person or they're gonna come to agree with you, but at least you can get both perspectives and understand somebody and where they're coming from. And too often I feel like, you know, whether we're talking mental health or whether we're talking, you know, um, the systematic racism, you know, like whatever you want to bring up the policing issues, you know, like if we would just listen and talk and hear both sides and, um, you know, I, I've been in too many conversations where, you know, it's like, I ask a question or I say something and instead of, you know, I'm asking to learn and to listen, but because of the way that I ask the question or because of the question I ask, it's like immediately assumed that I'm on one side or the other. And it's like, no, I didn't say I was on one side or the other. You know, if I, just because I say that Black Lives Matters, it doesn't mean that I believe in defunding police, like, but automatically that's assumed, right? It's like, well, let's talk about that. Why is it that assumed? You know, like, I just feel like there's so much going on in the world that to me, what's helped me is um, I always assume that people have the best intentions, right? Because most people do, not everybody, but most people do. And so when you assume that the person has the best intentions and you 
listen and you approach them if they say something like if somebody says something that I'm kind of like hmm I don't know if I understand that or if I you know I'm taking it like this but I don't really think you mean it like that I ask the person I don't just instantly assume and then cut them off and say I don't want to talk to you because you know you support this person or you believe this and I don't you know um you know everywhere you go you're going to have different opinions and different um views and different experiences and I think that we can all learn from one another and we can all support one another no matter what that is you know and it's just being willing to listen and being open to having those conversations and hearing people out yeah it's a, a what came to mind when you were just saying that is that if I'm going to be faulted or blamed for something, I would rather be blamed for having an open mind and in wanting to continue learning than um, for whatever reason, mostly because I feel threatened probably, um, finding my moments in that having a closed mind. For me, being in that closed minded section, I know that that will set me up for having regret and embarrassment later. So uh, I'd rather be a fool um, and and foolish being open-minded because I can live with that you know um, it's kind of like even if I give a hundred percent going in the wrong direction I would I would rather be blamed that I gave a hundred percent so um, right. so uh, Shavir, I so appreciate our conversations. Um, like many, like many times when we've talked, we never know for sure where it's going to go um, right. <laughs> and what we talk about. But what I do know, without a doubt, and and your partner Corey is is very much the same way that you have a heart for helping people, and you have uh, consistently through all the different setbacks in your life have 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 worked at making sure that your light, um, Brian, shut. A shine bright brightly shines that's, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to say um, and so I so appreciate what you do for our community and for the ones that are struggling in the darkness so uh, thank you for being with us today and if there's any last things that you would want to share and how is the best way for people to reach you well um, well we have our website which is the easiest way you can get on there and contact me and find out what's going on what we're doing which is just the Tommy Corral Memorial Foundation.com so that's the easiest way. We also have a Facebook page. Um, same thing, Tommy Crow Memorial Foundation. You can find us there and follow us. And, um, you know, I share a lot on my personal page, but also on that page and um, everything that, you know, we're doing and what's going on. So that's a good way to contact us. Perfect. Any last things that you would want anybody who's listening to know? Um, no, I don't think so. I think just, you know, keep fighting, keep hanging on and, um, you know, keep, keep reaching out. And, uh, you know, one of the things I always say is it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to accept it. So, you know, whether that's you needing help for someone else or you need help for yourself, just know that people care and that all it takes is to, um, to accept the help that's offered or reach out if you need it. Perfect. Thanks, Xavier. Uh, say hi to Corey for me and I'll be talking to you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks.